Today, our speaker is Dr. James Turner, uh, the second chair of uh, the Department of Psychiatry. Under his leadership, the psychiatry residency was created in cooperation with what is now Frontier Health, led to the construction of Wounded Hospital. He is the author of over 20 published journal articles and book chapters. Join me with the current member of the faculty of internal medicine, Dr. Ronald Hamby. They published a book for caregivers of those with Alzheimer's disease. The subject today is William Glasser, the man in his message. Please welcome to me. Is suspense killing you? <laughs> I'd like to begin by um, thanking the department for inviting me to take the stage again. What's it been, Janice? 25 years? Janice Lyons was my first uh, administrative assistant, also the only one I've ever had. And when I arrived, she helped me through the culture shock of moving to East Tennessee, uh, which, believe me, was quite a culture shock. For example, the chief complaint of most of the patients was, it's my nerves, doc. Well, that uh, was a bit of a head scratcher. But then I had the first real inquiry about my background from a patient who said, where are you all from? Where am I from? Is that a philosophical question? Where am I from? Well, um, I'm sorry, but I really don't understand the question. Well, you know, where did you live before you came here? to me. <laughs> well, before that, I was from North Texas, Canada. Ah, polar bears, right? No, that's Manitoba. I'm from British Columbia. We have grizzly bears. Oh, okay. What I really wanted to talk about today, however, was uh, psychiatry and gun control. Uh, somewhat controversial, you might say. But my friends at the dog park said, I don't think that's a very good idea. <laughs> you see, you might attract N-rats. N-rats? What are N-rats? Well, they're NRA terrorists. Well, I said, I've heard of eco-terrorists, but what are NRA terrorists? Well, they're guys who monitor the internet, and any time they see the two words gun, and control juxtaposed, they send out the troops. Hmm, well, didn't sound too good to me. He said, no, it's not, because at least 10% of those troops are going to be packing heat. So you might want to wear a bulletproof vest. Uh, bulletproof vest? I don't think so. I mean, Dr. Goodkin's not going to really appreciate a bulletproof vest, he might think that's some kind of East Tennessee custom that he hasn't yet met. So I dropped that subject. Maybe we'll do it some other time when the NRA does not believe that the Second Amendment to the Constitution was written by God and brought down by Moses from the mountain. Maybe that will happen. After all, you know, amendments are just that, amendments, right? The 18th Amendment, you remember that one? Prohibition. We still have it? No. We did away with it. So anyway, gun control, psychiatry, very interesting subject because psychiatrists are now getting in the middle of deciding who should own a gun and who should not. So we'd better be on our 
best behavior because the NRA rats might be out there somewhere. Anyway, the last time I wore a bulletproof vest was when I was in the United States Army. It was very uncomfortable. It was very hot. But my Army experience was interesting, very interesting. I was drafted in 1968, called up in 1969, and we had a company of 182 individuals. The only thing they had in common was they had an MD after their name, and they all had a green card. We didn't have a single US citizen in our company. The Army had run out of doctors, and so they decided they'd scrape the barrel and bring us in. Well, my assignment originally was to go to the prison at Fort Leavenworth, but at the last minute they changed it because the person who'd been assigned to the job I eventually got, an instructor at the medical field service school, couldn't speak English. I you think I'm exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating. Poor Boris, who's now in practice in White Plains, New York, had 250 words of English. And here he was, expecting to be a psychiatrist, instructing people how to behave in the US Army. The majority of my job was involved in instructing what are called 91Gs. The MOS has changed since then, but these were psychology, social work, technicians. And their job, was to be the advisor to the battalion commander, sometimes company commander, in issues such as morale, race relations, and they were expected to do some counseling. Well, I had spent four years in residency learning how to do psychotherapy, but we only had 10 weeks in which to train these individuals to go to Vietnam be advisors to company commanders, and counsel soldiers in the field. Ten weeks. But in addition, they had to learn the contents of DSM-2, which had just been published. They had to learn a little bit about the effects of medication. And they had to learn how to relate to company commanders, battalion commanders, and even, in some cases, generals. So we had a big job to do in 10 weeks. Now remember, this is 1969. We didn't have the benefits of behavior therapy and cognitive therapy. We had psychoanalysis, and we had Joe Wolpe and Arnold Lazarus's reciprocal inhibition, neither of which were teachable in 10 weeks. So it was then that I discovered William Glasser. And what happened was, I was looking at the newspaper in San Antonio, and I discovered that this man was giving a lecture at Wilford Hall Army, uh, US, uh, US Navy, Navy, US Air Force Hospital. So I asked my boss if I could go to this workshop put on by this man Glasser, who'd come from California, therefore he must know everything. And so I went to his lecture, and then to his workshop, and then I had dinner with him. And it was an eye-opener, because for the first time I discovered how I was going to be able to teach these 91 Gs how to do counseling in the field in a 10-week period. Now, Glasser is an interesting guy. He graduated with a bachelor's degree in Cleveland, Ohio, where his dad was a horologist. He was a <clears throat> clock repairman, watchmaker. And he got a degree in chemical engineering. Well, he didn't practice very long as a chemical engineer because he got drafted, just like I did. But instead of serving two years, he only served eight months because they didn't need him anymore. So he went with the 
economy experience and decided to get a master's degree in psychology. And after he got his master's degree in psychology, he said, nah, that's not what I want to do. I want to be a doctor. So he went to medical school. He went to medical school, and then he went to residency at UCLA. And just about the time that he started his residency, Thorazine was introduced. Now, you will remember that Thorazine introduced the third psychiatric revolution. We had the first revolution, which was <coughs> Pinel releasing the men from the chains in Bicetra. We had the second revolution, which was the discovery of ECT. And the third revolution, which was ushered in again in France by the discovery of Thorazine. Now, the reaction to Thorazine on the part of many of us, and of course I came along much later, was that this was a wonderful revelation. We could actually get people out of the state hospital and into the community again. And in fact, the numbers of patients in state hospitals in the United States and in Canada dropped by about 50% in 10 years. But William Glasser and Thomas Saz did not like the whole idea of these drugs. And most of all, they didn't like the fact that psychiatrists could incarcerate people against their will with no trial. So they objected to involuntary incarceration without trial. And they objected to the use of mind-altering drugs without the patient's permission. And here's a man who suffered as a result of that. This is Earl Long, who was the governor of Louisiana. He was arrested in the state capitol while still the governor, dragged off by the police, taken to a state mental hospital in Texas, injected through his clothes with multiple times psychoactive drugs. And eventually, he was returned to Louisiana made the front page of Time Magazine, and of course he fired the director of the state hospital. Earl Long ran for the Congress of the United States with this button. I ain't crazy, vote for Uncle Earl. And guess what? Now this is Louisiana we're talking about, he got elected. Of course, he didn't last very long. He died the day after he won the election. But nevertheless, he is an example of the sort of thing that Glasser and Thomas Saz were talking about. Here's Thomas Saz, who wrote the book, The Myth of Mental Illness, made a big splash, but got us thinking about what we're doing when we inject people with these drugs, when we give these drugs. Have we stopped thinking? Are we actually trying to make changes in their life? Here he is. Let me just look at this now. He says, labeling a child as mentally ill is stigmatization, not diagnosis. Giving a child psychiatric drugs is poisoning, not treatment. It's a bit of an extreme statement. But after all, these people make us think. And that's what we're all about, isn't it? So William Glasser went one further. He said, psychiatry can be hazardous to your mental health. I remember, this is a psychiatrist. He's been through a residency, and he's working at the VA hospital in Los Angeles, from which he claims he was fired because he couldn't subscribe to psychoanalysis. He made some rather extreme statements. I have this book they call the DSM-IV. <clears throat> that's supposed to be written by crazy people about, but it is actually written by crazy people. I don't know what he'd say about DSM-5. I haven't read it. OK, so he invented a therapy called reality therapy. And this is the one that I clung to while I was teaching 91Gs. Very, very straightforward. Very simple to teach. 
but an anchor for people who don't have a lot of experience with counseling. So my objectives this morning are first of all to describe the eight tenets of reality therapy and secondly to expand a little bit on the six that apply to patients. Okay, tenet number one is to be warm and friendly. Empathy and warmth are the major criteria of a good therapist. The seminal study that was done in 1977 by Smith and Glass, who looked at 375 well-done, well-controlled studies on psychotherapy, didn't matter what sort of psychotherapy, the number one thing that came through was that if the therapist is not warm and not friendly, people aren't going to get better. Let me give you an example from my own life. I was at Temple University in 1967-68, and Bruce Sloan, who was the chair, and Joe Walpe, who was the behavior therapist, decided to conduct an experiment to see what happened when residents did psychotherapy. So there were nine of us. We had six patients to treat for six months, and then we got another six patients for six months, and there were two criteria. You had to see the patient at least once every two weeks for at least 40 minutes, and you couldn't use drugs. Those were the criteria. So at the end of the year, all nine of us had treated 12 patients. And Joe Walpe, Bruce Sloan, did an analysis to find out what had happened. Well, two of the residents, all the patients got better. A little bit better, a lot better, but they were all improved by whatever criteria the two of them wanted to use. Five of the residents batted about 60-40. About 60% were better, a little bit better, 40% about the same, or maybe a little worse. But the significant finding was two of the residents made everybody worse. In fact, they had three suicides. Everybody got worse. Now, you'll never see this paper in print. You know the reason? If you read it, what would be your first question? Whatever happened to the two guys who made everybody worse? Guess what? They graduated, and they went out, and they're making people worse. You see, it's very hard in a residency program to get rid of people who come on time, who listen, who don't cause waves, even if they make people worse. So what was characteristic about these two individuals? They were chronically, morbidly depressed. They never smiled. They had no warmth. They had no empathy. And they made people worse. Very important characteristic. Number two, he says, stick to the here and now. The past is water under the bridge. Not important. Don't get stuck in the past. You want to take a history, you can go on forever, and the patient doesn't get any better. So what happened in the past that was painful has a great deal to do with what we are today, but rewriting this painful past can contribute little or nothing to what we need to know. You can go on taking a history forever. You can stick in the past forever. It doesn't make one bit of difference to the patient's progress. Tenet number three, the individual has to make a value judgment about their behavior. Now, let me give you an example. When I was doing my uh, first job after getting out of the army, I got a lot of medical students as patients. And one of them was a young woman who had been arrested for shoplifting. Uh, she was very bright, she was very attractive, and so, of course, the dean intervened. Uh, Jim, uh, you really have to help this young woman. If she does it again, it's going to be a felony. She's going to be thrown out of medical school. So please, take her in therapy and help her. 
So I did. We'd go nowhere. She'd come late. Sometimes she'd cancel. She wasn't involved. So I went to a colleague. I've always, in my professional life, had someone to bounce ideas off. Someone who'd been a mentor to me when I was a resident. And I said, Harry, I bet the student, she's very bright, but I'm not getting anywhere in therapy with her. So he asked a little bit of the background. I told him. He said, well, he said, has she made a value judgment about her behavior? I said, well, she's a medical student. You know, it, she's very bright. Yes. So what difference does that make? Well, you know, got to make allowances for students. She's busy, etc. Has she made a value judgment about her behavior? I said, well, no, not really. Said, of course, she's not involved. She's not involved. She's not engaged. And most of all, she hasn't made a commitment. So that's the next one. Got to make a pl commitment and a plan for change. Harry went on. By the way, she's still stealing. I said, what do you mean she's still stealing? He said, she is still stealing. OK? How do you know? Read the literature. So I went back and read the literature. And sure enough, right there it says, kleptomania. The patients are involved in the therapy. They're not going to get better. It didn't matter to this young woman that if she got caught again and had a felony offense, she'd be thrown out of medical school. She could not make a commitment. So I said, well, how do I get her committed? He said, you have a right to biography. I said, I thought we weren't going to get involved in the No, no, no. He says, you take a biography, and then you rip it up, and you say, this is not what I asked for. And I said, well, suppose it's a good one. He said, what's the matter? Just rip it up. He says, because what you want is for her to write down what she's going to do about changing. What's she involved with? How is she going to change? Because that's what it's all about. OK. Well, eventually, she graduated from medical school. She married a classmate. And she invited me to the wedding. I don't know what that means, but I went anyway. OK, so if you want to change attitudes, you've got to start with a change in behavior. And this is the major tenet of William Glasser's therapy. It's now called change therapy. He is involved in wanting people to invest in changing. You know, in the days before the bean counters took over the delivery of mental health in the public sector, when actually psychiatrists could do therapy, I used to ask patients, sorry, clients, sorry, consumers, <laughs> sorry, customers. I used to ask consumers, <clears throat> I hate that word, um, what are you doing in therapy? What do you mean, what am I doing in therapy? Well, I mean, what's going on when you sit with your therapist? Oh, well, we, we talk about how I'm doing. Uh huh. And how are you doing? Well, well not great. Well, I mean, what else do you talk about? Uh, well, we talk about uh, my symptoms, you know, and my depression and my anxiety. Uh -huh. What else? Well, we talk about the past and you know my mother and my dad and my brothers and my sisters. Uh huh. What else? That's about it. Hmm. That's about it. Do you know up in Big Stone Gap, where I worked for four years, therapists actually fell asleep while they were sitting with patients. Can you imagine what it does to your self-esteem if your therapist thinks you're so boring that they fall asleep? So I would go to their supervisor and say, what the hell's going on here? You've got people who are supposed to be doing therapy. There's no change in the patient's behavior. Oh, well, we have a lot of supervision to do. Uh, we can't exactly go in there and watch what they're doing. Ah, oh, hello. If you can't watch what they're doing, how do you know?
okay, it's almost impossible for anyone, even the most ineffective among us, to continue to choose misery after becoming aware that it's a choice. Novel idea. Okay, I've already talked about the fact that we need to get a commitment. Now sometimes, even with very bright people, this requires that the patient actually write out a commitment to whatever the changes are that they have agreed on. Can't be what you agree to. Can't be what they agree to. I agree to do X, Y, Z. Okay. Don't do it. Make a commitment. Do it for me. Don't do it for anyone else. No one else out there pushing you. No one else there guiding you. Do it for me. Okay, so tenet number six, no excuses. Patient doesn't follow through with the plan they've made with you and the commitment. No excuses. <laughs> William Glass had talked about the fact that patients would come and they'd be late. And they want to talk about why they're late. He said, I'm not interested in why you're late. I started without you. <laughs> we, had a, we had a resident when I was here. Always late. Every time. Late for patients. Late for clinic. Late for rounds at Woodridge. Late for supervision. Late for the talks that we had for the residents. Late. Chronically late. Well, fortunately, he transferred. Didn't like psychiatry. I don't blame him. Went into internal medicine. No, he went into a specialty, really. Anyway, the other day, I'm in the office. I'm seeing one of his partners. And a patient walks up. Knock, knock. I'm sorry, I've been waiting for a doctor. And I won't use his name. For an hour and a quarter. You think the receptionist apologized? Hmm. She said, he's always late. I guess we didn't teach him anything. So, no excuses. Now, this does not mean that you engage in punishment. You don't criticize, you don't cajole, you don't get on their case. You simply say, <coughs> I can't accept excuses. We need to work on a different plan. If you can't be on time, maybe we need to do something about that. No punishment. And finally, you never give up. Kind of a Winston Churchill tenet. It's easy to get frustrated when people don't follow through with that they promised they'd do. But you never give up. Because you'd be surprised how many times you are the only person in the patient's life who makes a difference. The only one who supports them. The only one who really cares whether they get better or not. So you have to keep on trucking. Now, you may think this is a very simple process. It's actually not. Because you have to keep doing it over and over and over. I had a friend <clears throat> who'd been in residency with me named Winston Mahabir. Bright guy. He'd been the Minister of Health in Trinidad. Anyway, we went through our residency program together and we're at a meeting in San Diego, the Amer American Psychiatric Association meeting, and he saw me sitting in a restaurant by myself and he came and said, can I join you? And I said, sure. He said, I hate to ask you this, Jim, but um, what is psychotherapy all about? I said, Winston, you were in, in uh, the residency program just like me. You did three years. What do you mean? What's psychotherapy all about? He said, well, you know, I know taking a history and talking to a patient about their symptoms and giving them medication, blah, blah, blah. That's what I do in the office. But what is therapy? I said, well, if I can teach Emma, uh, 91 Gs in 10 weeks, I can teach you in 20 minutes. So I just went through the list. 
Warm and friendly, here and now, make a value judgment, plan for change, get the patient to make a commitment, no excuses, no punishment, never give up. I don't know whether he carried it out, but he seemed to be satisfied, and he ate the rest of his meal anyway. Okay, William Glasser went on to change the name of his therapy from reality therapy to choice therapy. And, interestingly, a whole bunch of people in the world decided that he had something to say. So there are institutes now all over the world, even, get this, in Iran. USA, Canada, Australia, South Africa, Uh, no comment, really. So here's the man who I believe, instead of building walls, opened doors. At least he did for me. And I hope maybe for some of you, he'll open a door. We may be up against a stone wall, but we don't have to bloody our heads against it unless we choose to. And that, as Chief Ten Bears would say, is all I have to say. Thank you for your attention. Happy to entertain any questions or comments. See if I can push this off. Good. Yes. You have to speak up, because I'm a little bit deaf. Yes. I think that, I mean, certainly I think one needs to persist with patients for a, a long time. Those that may not be working in what we would like them to progress towards whatever goal, however you want to define it. But I think there is a point at which, you know, you have to make a decision if they are not going to make a commitment, if they are not going to work with, the, with whatever the decision has been, that we actually put some limits and actually plan for an end to that particular type of Of course. That may not be the most suitable. Of course. At that point. Everyone hear the question? There is a, an, a, a time when obviously you're not going anywhere, the patient is not getting involved in the therapy. So it's a generalization. All of these things really are. A little bit of generalization. It's just an outline. But the idea is that you don't just quit because the person at the beginning doesn't get involved, you keep on going. But obviously, there's a time when you say, this is not leading anywhere. We're wasting our time here. Yes, there was another question. OK, we get away early today. Have a good day. <laughs>